Now let's look at some lipids. Now one of the examples I've drawn here is of a fatty acid. And this is the first type of lipid that we're going to look at. And you will see immediately that it's mostly carbons and hydrogens. So typically we have a ratio of carbons to hydrogens that is very close to one to two. So for every carbon, we have approximately two hydrogens, give or take. And so what characterizes this fatty acid is, is we have this long carbon tail. And the carbons all have hydrogens attached. And when we have single covalent bonds between all the carbons, we call this saturated because it has every single hydrogen on there that we could possibly get on there. So this presence of all the hydrogens that we could possibly get on there means it's saturated or saturated with hydrogens. Now, as we've seen before, carbon makes four covalent bonds. It could make a double covalent bond with itself. So just imagine that we had a double covalent bond with carbon to carbon here. So that leaves only one extra bond for the hydrogen here. So we have a double covalent bond between these two carbons, single covalent bonds on the adjacent carbons, and then a single covalent bond with the hydrogen. This is now a double covalent bond, and that makes this an unsaturated molecule because we now have introduced a double covalent bond. If we had more than one double covalent bond, this would be what we call polyunsaturated. So right now this is monounsaturated because we have one double bond. Now the interesting thing about this double bond is that if we go back to a saturated molecule here for a little bit, and we look at these single covalent bonds around the carbons, the single covalent bonds have some degrees of freedom. So they're like little axles. The hydrogens can actually just kind of spin around. So there's nothing to prevent these hydrogens from spinning around, kind of like if you've ever seen some of these sci-fi movies with the space stations with the outer part that rotate around the inner arm, that's very similar to what we would have here. Those hydrogens can rotate freely around that carbon, and this single covalent bond acts kind of as an axle. Now, when we replace the single covalent bond there with a double covalent bond, this makes the molecule rigid and usually will introduce a kink in the molecule. So if we look at this, this long carbon tail, typically the way carbons will bond would look more like this. So we have our hydrogens coming off this way and so forth. And I'll just draw lines that denote that this molecule continues on. But in any case, Sorry about that. In any case, we have a configuration that really looks more like this. And so oftentimes when we abbreviate a fatty acid, which is what this is, we will abbreviate the carbon tail just simply as a zigzag line. And it's understood that there are two hydrogens coming off each carbon, like so. Now, another thing about this, though, is when we introduce the double bond, that will introduce a kink in the molecule so that our fatty acid then will not be this kind of nice zigzag and more or less a linear shape, but will have a kink in it like so. So it will bend this molecule. And this will become important later on when we study a different kind of lipid that is built from these fatty acids. So far, we have looked at the fatty acid tail, which is consisting of carbon and hydrogen. Regardless of where, whether it's single bonded or double bonded, we still see that all of these are nonpolar covalent bonds. So they don't like water. They don't interact well with water at all. And anytime you put something like this into water, these hydrocarbon tails will sequester themselves away from water as much as they can. And this is why if you put cooking oil on top of water, it'll form a slick and they'll form two different layers because those things will not interact with one another. However, when we look at the head of this thing, we have something called a carboxyl group. And that's this part right here. And you'll notice it has oxygens. And these oxygens are polar. And so water will interact with the head of this thing, but will not interact with the tail.
Now another thing we will notice is this is called a fatty acid. And you wonder, well, why is it called a fatty acid? Well, remember our hydroxyl group, and we've seen what it can do in water. We've seen what it does in carbonic acid. Well, here we have a hydroxyl group at the head of this thing, or sorry, a carboxyl group at the head of this thing that has a hydroxyl on it. And so what can happen? Well, this hydrogen can leave, and it can leave its electron behind, and this is therefore a carboxylic acid because it can put proton into solution and it can give up a hydrogen ion. So this is a fatty acid because it can give up a, a proton. Now, the next type of lipid that we're going to talk about is a triglyceride. And the triglycerides will be made up of three fatty acids plus another molecule. So fatty acids and lipids don't polymerize the way sugars do, but they do link on to other molecules. And the molecule of interest that we're going to be looking at now is called a glycerol molecule. And it's got three carbons. And then we have got some hydroxyl groups coming off of these three carbons, like so. And then we'll just draw them like this. And then the rest we have hydrogens. So this molecule right here is a glycerol molecule. And a glycerol is a type of sugar alcohol. So what will happen is we can link a fatty acid onto a glycerol molecule. And in this reaction, we will get water as a byproduct. So we can actually take the hydrogen off of here and the hydrogen off of here and a hydroxyl group off of one of these. So we can take the hydroxyl group off of here. And link it with a hydrogen off of here to get water. So we link one of these things on here and we get water as a byproduct. And if I redraw this on here, we basically have something that looks like this. So this will be attached to a carbon obviously, with a, another oxygen here. And then remember I said that the fatty acid can just be abbreviated as a jagged or a zigzag line. So our fatty acid can link onto here like this and produce a water as a byproduct of this linking. Now, once we have done this, we have something called a monoglyceride because we have linked one fatty acid to the glycerol molecule. Now, if we were to do this one more time and link another fatty acid to the glycerol molecule, and once again, in this case, you know, I'll denote the head group here with the other oxygen there, but typically we could link a second fatty acid on here. And now we have a diglyceride. We could do this one more time and we could have a triglyceride. And I'll make this one with a double bond so that it's kind of kinked. Do it this way. So we could link three fatty acids onto one glycerol molecule. But you'll notice we don't have any more room for any more fatty acids. So we can get three up to three fatty acids on this glycerol molecule to create a triglyceride. And we can't add any more because there's no more room. So one thing we know about triglycerides is you need one glycerol molecule, which kind of acts as a keychain to link these fatty acids on like keys, but the keychain can only hold up to three keys. Now we have another kind of molecule very similar to a triglyceride that is called a phospholipid. So what it would look like is we would have atoms that will be attached to what is called a phosphate group and the phosphate group, I'm going to draw a little bit differently, is going to look like this. So there's going to be a phosphorus in the middle of it. And it'll look something like this. So this would be a phosphate group. And a lot of times, because we're not really interested in what's on the other end of this thing, we just abbreviate this with a letter R. And the letter R simply means, for our purposes, 
the rest of the molecule. So the letter R can stand in for the rest of the molecule. Now another thing you'll remember that I said a few moments ago is that a single covalent bond between a carbon can rotate. So we have this diglyceride here. We could just as easily find the hydroxyl group on the other side of this thing. Because remember, so this is oxygen here. that this bond here is free to rotate. So a lot of times what we will find is that the phosphate group will be on this side. So if I were to erase this thing, or really draw it again, and draw at the core of this molecule, we have our glycerol molecule, and we're going to have a fatty acid attached, and I'll just draw it like this. And I'll draw another fatty acid here. And remember there are hydrogens on the other carbons here. We'll put the hydrogen on this one over here, and we'll put the oxygen here. And what we'll find is we get something that looks a lot like this. And here again, R is just the rest of the molecule. So we get something that looks like this. And once again, we have this molecule that is centered around a core of glycerol. So here is our glycerol molecule at the center of everything. And of course, I'm going to go back and denote the oxygens in red, because every time you see one of these oxygens, we have a polar covalent bond, and therefore, we have an affinity for water. So the typical thing that we will see is that the head of the phospholipid molecule tends to like water, whereas the tails do not. And this will become very important, especially when we get into membrane structure of cells in the next chapter. So this is a very important property of phospholipids, and we will find that phospholipids are an extremely important structural component of cells. The next lipid that we're going to talk about is based on this four ring structure, where we have four rings that are carbon, and they have other components on them. And this is the basis for a molecule called cholesterol, which is not only an important component in cell membranes that gives it stiffness, but it also is the basis for all of our steroid hormones. So cholesterol is a steroid, and it is the basis for all the hormones like cortisone, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and so forth. So without cholesterol, we would not be able to produce a very important bunch of hormones that governs how our body functions and also governs a lot of the processes within our body. Not only that, but cholesterol is produced in the liver. So the body can manufacture its own cholesterol, and in some individuals, they manufacture more cholesterol than they need, and this can become a problem, because if you have too much cholesterol, especially if your serum levels in blood of cholesterol are too high, then you're at risk for things like coronary artery disease and other problems.